Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak to you today. It's uh, uh, a very exciting conference. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and embarrassingly, I must say, after that introduction, I actually did my PhD in artificial intelligence at Stanford in California. So uh, uh, it's, it's actually, I would recommend going to California if you're interested. Um, but today I'm going to speak about uh, the role artificial intelligence and machine learning, and in particular deep learning, uh, is going to play in healthcare. And I'm going to try to convince you uh, of my view that it is actually vital for healthcare sustainability that, um, that smart machines, I'm going to, instead of saying deep learning and artificial intelligence, I'm just going to say smart machines, play a much more uh, active role in the system. And I just want to say, because I'm going to review the uh, healthcare system a little bit, and, and I, I'm going to really show a bit of what, what's going on in healthcare, but I want to say up front that the people working in healthcare are very hardworking, they're smart, they're dedicated, but they're working in a system which almost makes it impossible for them to deliver high quality healthcare. It's a system that was developed hundreds of years ago and we are still using it today despite of all the changes that have, going, that have gone on in healthcare in the last uh, 20 years. So uh, let's start by looking at well, what are the problems really facing healthcare and so uh, let's take the United States. I'm just going to use data from all over the place, but let's look at the United States. And what are the major causes of uh, healthcare uh, deaths? What, what are the causes of death uh, in, in the healthcare uh, over in the US? Any, any um, so what sort of problems, what, what do people die from? Has anyone got any volunteer, uh, volunteer any ideas in, in English, please? Uh, sorry? Can cancer, suicide. Uh, let's have a look. So first of all, cardiovascular. As you guess, cancer is, is a big one. Uh, Self-harm goes is, is further down. Uh, guns is, is, not, is not in the top 15. But number three is the healthcare system. So the healthcare system is the third largest cause of death in the United States and many other countries. And uh, uh, this is uh, in, a, in a system which spends a lot of money on healthcare. Uh, so on the, on the uh, I'll just see if this works. That is the amount spent per capita on healthcare. US is, is very high. And this is life expectancy. So what you can see is that as we invest more, to a certain point, you do get improvements in healthcare. But then after that, it starts to level off. And, and you can spend more on healthcare, but you don't necessarily get better health uh, for your population if you're using life expectancy. But, but this is similar across a range of measures. And, the other thing about it is that the cost where that's being spent uh, is a, a little difficult to track. So here's uh, MRI scan. So MRIs are, are expensive tests. And um, the variation is about five or six fold between countries that really like MRIs versus countries that don't use them very much. And it doesn't correlate to improved outcomes in, in healthcare. <clears throat> Now, I'm just going to choose one more example, and that's acute myocardial infarctions of heart attacks. So this is, if you have a heart attack, unfortunately, uh, this is how long you'll stay in hospital. So Denmark is about four days, and it varies by about three times. But then if you track a quality measure of how people are managed with heart attacks, uh, how many people die after th 30 days of, of the initial heart attack, uh, you can see that... Uh, Denmark's, again, really good. They have a low rate, but other countries where you spend a lot of time in hospital don't have very good rates. So there's, again, uh, this break between the amount of effort and the amount of healthcare expenditure and the quality of care. Hospitals are just dangerous places. So uh, there are quality studies in healthcare that have documented this for years. 15% uh, or so of patients coming into hospital will have an adverse event. Not all of that will re result in harm. Uh, studies have shown that about 40% of lab results, blood tests that are ordered in hospitals are never looked at. Uh, you've got 30% of patients who have a heart attack not getting on the right guidelines. And heart attack is one area where we have really good guidelines and good data. And misdiagnosis and or late diagnosis is actually uh, very common. So this is, this is where the healthcare system is at today. And we could I could stand here all day showing you graphs like this. It is, it is really a, a major problem across all countries. And the only consistent thing about healthcare is, is the amount of unexplained variation in healthcare. 
Um, and so our system today isn't really working that well, and the bad news is it's going to get a lot worse. And uh, uh, I'm, I could tell you that getting old is, is uh, no fun, but let's uh, quantify this, shall we? So this is uh, the data on, on how unpleasant it is to get old. Uh, so as you get older, you just get more diseases. Uh, so from 50s up to over 75, so about half of the population over 75 will have some kind of arthritis and, and you get multiple of these conditions. So as you get older, uh, it's just, you know, this is why old people complain so much. They really have good reason to complain. And uh, this is from Canada, and it shows that as you get older, a lot more money is spent on your healthcare. And you can see this up quite rapidly. So most of you are, look, look quite young, you'll be around this area. I'm over here getting a bit older, cost a bit more, but I would argue there's a cost-benefit kind of relationship there. But as you get older, you're not in the workforce and, you, and you know, it's a lot of money is spent. Oh, Siri is trying to determine. Now, a reason, the reason this is important is because uh, the population in general is getting old. So this is uh, up here, you can't read it, about 60 or so is around there. So this is looking at the pr proportion of the population above 65. And this is in about 2000. And what we're show what, what's happening is by 2050, a significantly larger number of people are going to be in that high expense group uh, cons of consumers of healthcare, uh, right across. Um, and people in, the, in a few years will wonder why this was ever called a population pyramid, because except for Africa, they don't look like pyramids at all. Uh, so give you an example, in Australia, uh, over the, the next 35 years, and this is similar across the West and in Asia, the proportion of people over 85 is going to increase by four times. Um, and, you know, which is why uh, everyone's rushing for self-driving cars, because the whole highway system will collapse if, if uh, all those people are trying to drive cars, because we also know that old people are not very good drivers. Um, so I, I'm, I'm saying that because I'm going to be in that age group over there, so you know, that, that's, that's my problem. Uh, so we know uh, if the demand on healthcare is going to increase around three times in the existing model, if we continue with our existing model, what do, what do we do? Do we build three times as many hospitals and try to staff them with three times as many uh, doctors and nurses? Yeah, or countries will go bankrupt. It's not possible to do this. The only model that works is that we have to dramatically increase the efficiency and safety of hospitals, and two-thirds of people who are sick have to be dealt with outside of the hospital. There really isn't that much of an alternative. The only thing we can guarantee if we build three times as many hospitals is that healthcare will probably be the number one cause of death in a lot of countries. So what is the current model? The current model is based, as I said, on uh, a model that was designed many hundreds of years ago and it was based on this idea that knowledge is power. So the doctor has the knowledge and they have the power. And the knowledge they had when this model was uh, developed was when there was probably only a few dozen diseases, a few dozen treatments, and now we're dealing with many sophisticated problems and diseases, very expensive therapies and, very exp and, and high risk therapies and treatments. So the model's changed and what happens is that the doctor, uh, you go to your doctor and they will do some tests, they'll do examinations, they'll uh, look at lab tests, look at uh, uh, potentially x-rays and other things, and then they'll say, well, should you go to the hospital or should you see another doctor uh, or can I treat you with some procedures or medicines? And at the moment, there's probably tens of data items, maybe a hundred data items. But even then, we have uh, one of the really interesting parts about uh, the medical industry, as we've convinced everyone that this is actually a humanly possible task, that we can uh, take in hundreds of data items and customise the best therapy for, uh, for an individual patient, all within a five or ten minute uh, appointment. 
It's just not humanly possible. There's a lot of good data. You can look at the data from Kahneman and Tversky who talk about the problems of cognitive bias and, and how our brains are just not designed to, to uh, balance fine probabilities. That's not the way we're designed. And that's kind of what we're expecting doctors to do. And that's why I said these are hardworking people doing an impossible task. Um, also, uh, in a way, it's a bit like Walmart, you know, that big supermarket. Um, it, if, or any large supermarket chain, if we were expecting them to use horse and carriages to carry around their stock, that's really what we're doing with doctors today. So what is the future model? Uh, oh, click here. So the future model uh, is going to be, let, let's pretend for a moment there's a thing called a smart machine, which can take data from uh, devices in our home that might not just be on about your heart rate, but as uh, Pierre said, uh, increasingly sophisticated uh, data capture. So blood pressure, glucose, pulse oximetry, a whole lot of other uh, things that, that we can learn. And it can send that to a smart machine, which can analyze thousands of data points, rather than just a couple of data points when you go see your doctor, we can capture thousands of data points so the system knows what's normal for you and what is getting worse or what is getting better. And then this smart machine can still make recommendations to doctors or you can choose to go to a doctor if that's what you want, but you don't need to go to a doctor. The doctor isn't the, the, the gatekeeper of all the care. So for example, uh, further tests. Uh, that why shouldn't a computer be allowed to prescribe? Um, it, 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 it can do better. We know it can do better than uh, uh, people. And, but you might want telephonic coaching. You might want to see a doctor, but you don't need to see a doctor. And this model is really saying data is power. If the system has enough data and knows about you, then it's going to be able to integrate thousands of points of data rather than just the tens that, that we can do in our heads if, if we're good, if we're good at it. The other thing that's uh, happening is, um, is stethoscopes, for example, uh, even medical examination. So a stethoscope is a rubber tube that with a metal bit you put on someone to hear what is rubbing inside them or, or fluid that's sloshing about, and um, which is, which is you know, which is interesting, but, but now with handheld ultrasound, we can actually see what's inside. And again, computers are good with images, and they can use that data a lot more effectively. Uh, also, uh, after all the uh, billions of dollars in, in genomics, we're assuming that genomics will be useful to us at some point in the future, and that will generate tens of thousands of more points uh, of data that need to be incorporated. And the missing part that we can sometimes forget up by the patient is, are their preferences? What do they want to achieve in terms of their own health care? What outcomes are they seeking? And how do you incorporate that into a healthcare system which is dealing with three or four times as much load? So the future model is really basing a lot on this, this cool smart machine thing. You know, it's like a, a startup business plan. You just say, well, magic will happen and then we'll have lots of profit. So, so is this smart machine a myth or, or is this real? And I'm not a, I'm not a futurist. I'm not a, uh, I, I, I deal with a lot more of the technology involved. And so let's go back 40 years. And it was about 40 years ago that uh, the data came out that computers could actually work at expert levels. So in a whole range of areas, and these are some old systems that uh, I won't go into, but they showed that computers can perform at expert levels in the medical area. Uh, but the problem was they, they were difficult to integrate with the system. They required people to type in extra stuff. This is the same, re the, 40, the lesson from 40 years ago, IBM doesn't seem to have learnt. People, doctors don't go and seek advice from computers, even though computers can actually help. That just hasn't happened. Uh, they were brittle in the sense that uh, it was, if uh, the patient didn't exactly miss, uh, sorry, a fit, then they wouldn't, wouldn't quite work. The other thing was these were based on expert opinion. And again, we're basing the idea that a doctor uh, who's an expert can explain what their expertise is. And, that, and that, that is not always true. They are an expert, but explaining how they work is actually being shown to be a, um, uh, an issue. 
So, but the other, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that today, diagnosis isn't the main problem. 75% uh, is managing chronic disease. So diagnosis isn't the key, the key issue here. And a lot of those systems were uh, uh, diagnostic uh, area, uh, uh, systems. So uh, back in the 90s when I was at Stanford, I, I worked on uh, probabilistic models. So this is one of the networks from my PhD work. Uh, each one of these is uh, a concept which has a probability distribution and a group of us were keen on using, uh, rather than experts, using rational decision making. So prior probabilities, uh, getting together, uh, updating with likelihoods to come with posterior probabilities and using patient preferences to come up with maximum expected utility decision making. And that's all just technical for saying you had to do a lot of maths to get the right numbers out. And what was interesting, though, was that the probabilities would propagate through the network, not just top-down, which is you know, what neural networks do, but they were computationally expensive, and, and we didn't have enough data to, to drive all those numbers uh, back in the day. But what we did find was that the num specific numbers weren't as important as the overall structure, and we'll see that that's a lesson that's been learned again in neural networks. So to put all of history of AI in one slide. Uh, the traditional model was we would go to an expert, uh, we would hand craft uh, a model and a structure and, and put that into a knowledge base, and then we would have some fancy algorithms that would work on the knowledge base to give you uh, outputs and recommendations. And what came out in uh, a bit later uh, was uh, the traditional uh, machine learning ML approach, which came out of statistics and, and uh, tree learning. And that would take data, would select what are the important features in that data, and then put it into an algorithm which would learn how to use that data uh, and give us recommendations. And that worked pretty well. And in fact, the success of that traditional model is what was killed the second wave of neural networks. Neural networks are on their third wave. The first wave was in the 1960s with perceptrons, which was uh, uh, killed off uh, because of it, their limitations. The 90s were the second wave, which worked a bit better, but uh, had some limitations as you tried to make them deeper and more sophisticated. And the third wave, which started in the mid-2000s, and what we're seeing now is uh, the model where you take data and you throw it at uh, an algorithm, a training algorithm, which is a neural network, and it will learn which features are most important and the relationship to the structure. And the modern networks can even learn new algorithms as well. For those of you who are in computing, uh, they're Turing complete. So the third, what's changed in terms of neural networks? I'll get this clicker to move. Great. So what happened was, uh, let's look at the area of speech recognition. So what happened was uh, speech recognition had been uh, looking at about a 25% error rate for, for a lot of years. And then suddenly, in 2011, in one go, it was dropped to about 15% and it's come down. And that was due to a deep model, a deep neural network model. The same happened in image recognition, 30, about 25% down to 15% and it's now gone to below 5%. And what was interesting is that this came out of research groups that weren't specializing in image recognition or speech. Uh, they hadn't been doing decades of work in the area, they'd been doing many years of work in neural networks, and they were able to really blow uh, the field open in terms of performance uh, just with this one set of tools. And that got, that got everyone's attention. Of course, at the same time, we're talking about driving car, uh, self-driving cars and, um, and, and a whole range of other uh, technologies, and obviously AlphaGo has been getting a lot of attention uh, in the last uh, week. Does everyone know what AlphaGo is? Is everyone sort of... Been playing, heard about the Go playing computer that's beating world champions. So what's happened? So there's been some technical improvements. The big thing is large volumes of data. These things require a lot of data. And the ability to compute that data using graphical processing engines. So the same graphics that, that generates uh, uh, you know, amazing violent video games is being used to train networks. So Let's give an idea of what these networks are. So, so they're multiple layers of connected units or nodes, or neurons sometimes they're called. And if you put in a training set, let's say you give it one face, and we're trying to teach it to recognize faces. You, give it a, you, you break apart that and you, you put it in as input. 
And what will happen is it will make a prediction through these multiple layers. And each one of these lines is a weight, a weight between these nodes, these layers. And what happens, you'll say, well, OK, the first predictions are pretty bad. They haven't um, done very well. And we, we get the error, the amount of difference between what was supervi uh, what we've told it is a good outcome and what it predicted. And we back propagate that error, which adjusts all the weights, fiddles with all the weights to improve prediction. And that's pretty much the same thing that happened in the 90s. Uh, and what we find here is that networks learn in unusual ways. So let's stick with the image side here. So in the first layer, they pick up edges, the edges of different parts of the body, not the whole face. Then the second layer pulls together those edges to look at higher level functions, maybe like edges of mouths or eyes or noses. And then the third layer constructs faces from those parts. So each previous layer is breaking apart the problem and making it easier for the next layer to split uh, the, the features up into ways that they can assemble at further layers down. And no one's programmed that in. That's the interesting part. It's learnt that decomposition of features by itself if you can give it enough data. And there are some huge networks being constructed at the moment. So just briefly, I'll talk about the term artificial intelligence. I don't like the term artificial intelligence. I think it's a distraction. The idea of whether a computer can think is, is good to talk about at the pub, but it doesn't really help us solve the healthcare crisis. Um, and the other thing about artificial intelligence is that we people make outrageous claims. And Marvin Minsky, who's, who, who, who you know, is a hero of mine, still made these outrageous claims. I thought that we would solve all of artificial intelligence by 1978 or something. Um, and the other thing to remember is task-specific AI doesn't reflect on the general intelligence problem. So IBM didn't take... Watson from Jeopardy and say now see patients. They spent five years trying to engineer it to, to, do, to, to uh, understand healthcare. AlphaGo isn't just going to come straight out and then help diagnose or manage patients. That's, it, these are task specific. They're highly trained on specific outcomes. So images uh, without having seen a, a child or this or a doll before the uh, network can recognize what's in there and then give a pretty good uh, explanation of what's in there. And, and there are two types of networks. One which is highly specialised for images, but AlphaGo used it uh, to recognise board positions. Uh, and recurrent networks, uh, which you'll see if you're interested in LSTM or, or GRUs. And, and there are a range of toolkits, so all the big companies have released their toolkits so people can uh, play with uh, this technology at home if you, if you, if you have a few uh, months or years to, to spare. Uh, I won't go into the details, but basically what's happened over the years is uh, people have tweaked the algorithms to not fail on, on these deeper networks. Because what would happen in the past is the, the, the maths wouldn't, wouldn't work out and, and uh, the, the networks wouldn't learn right across the layers. And those have been solved by and large. There's still a lot of active work going on in this area. But basically, we've got a, a, a function, an activation function that takes in inputs and we, can, we know which, which way to tweak it to get better prediction. And that's really what they do. And the problem is there's a lot of trial and error. There isn't a lot of science. You're really just mucking around with this stuff. How many nodes? You know, we don't have a smart machine to tell us how to configure a smart machine for a new task. We, it really is a lot of mucking around. And in the past, it would take weeks or months to train a computer. That big network, when, that's, that wasn't a neural network, but when I was uh, researching it, uh, it would take about a thousand hours for me to pull my research together in, in, in the late 90s. Today I could do it in about 30 seconds on my iPhone. That's how big we've, uh, how far we've come and the cost for that has just reduced. Sorry, PowerPoints. Uh, so this is how much we're paying per floating, per billion floating point operations. How fast can we crunch maths? Right, because these things take a lot of crunching, and in the past it was forty-two thousand dollars to get a billion maths operations, and now it's eight, eight cents. So in the last, it's no coincidence that that has coincided with the improvements in in deep learning, because they now instead of weeks, we can do it in hours, and because it's so much experimenting, you really need to keep trying uh, to do this. So. 
great, we have this magic thing that we can point it at healthcare, uh, but there are some things to be careful about. Um, so deep networks, it's hard to read, but uh, this says armadillo. So the deep network thought this was an armadillo. It thought this was an electric guitar and thought this was a peacock. And it was really confident about it. And uh, so when they go wrong, they can go unpredictably wrong. And, uh, and they're hard to debug. It's because they're not learning things in the way that we, we've told them to. They're just learning features. And some of those features can be spread through multiple layers. Uh, and it's still descriptive. I mean, they're learning what has happened from the data. So my belief and what we're working on is uh, using them as, as part of an ensemble method. So how do we get smart machines? We need lots of data. And because it's supervised, we have to actually tell it what a good outcome is so it knows what, what practice patterns have led to a good outcome and what practice patterns may have led to a bad outcome and be able to detect or you know, what, what physiological parameters should they be looking at to detect when someone is starting to get sicker so we can intervene earlier and they don't end up in those expensive, uh, dangerous hospitals. But for a hospital, what is a good outcome? A good outcome for a hospital is getting you out in enough time and not spending too many resources on you so they can make a profit. But if they get you out early, uh, I'm not criticising that, that's the way the system is designed. But if they get you out early and you go home, well, have you suffered? Did, did someone die? Did someone actually have to go to a nursing home? Did someone, did a, 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 someone in their family have to leave their job to come home and look after them? That is not a good outcome for the patient, but we don't track that across the system. So we actually don't know what a good outcome is. And the ironic part, the frustrating part, is we now have these machines that we can train to help us make healthcare sustainable but we haven't got the quality of data to feed them because we don't have accountability in healthcare. We don't track what is accountable. So where is the patient-centric outcome data that we need to make machines smart? So we have the magic, we don't have the ingredients to drive it. And the bottom line, I guess, is that it's up to the patient. And it's, it's unfortunately a bit of a circular argument, but if we want to optimise machines for patients, we have to have patients involved in generating the data and telling what is a good outcome, what made them satisfied with their healthcare and what didn't. And then we need to be able to share it and de in a de-identified way so that we can innovate and so, so people can take that and build the machines that we need uh, to sustain healthcare. So there's a saying in business that you shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. It's always an opportunity to make changes. And Intel in the, in the uh, 2000s, they had 98% of the PC market and they would spend money to engineer a sense of crisis to spur on innovation. But in healthcare, we're really lucky. We have a crisis all the time and we've got a bigger crisis coming. We just need to take advantage of it. Thank you.